And then a very interesting thing happened um, in high school for me. In late my junior year, the guidance counselor came to me and said, did you take the SAT? And I said, no. And he said, why not? I said, because we don't have any money and I'm not going to college. I'm going to go to work in the factory with my mom and that's my path and that's what I'm going to do. And he got a funny look on his face and he said, if I could find the money for you to go to college, would you go? And college sounded a lot better to me than working in the factory. I had already been doing that. And I said, sure. He said, okay, here's the deal. If you take the SAT and you get scores good enough to go to college and you get in, I'll find the money. I said, great, deal. So I take the uh, SAT and get good enough scores to get in. And I apply to one school, Rhode Island College. Nothing like what my kids have been through, touring schools and getting in. And uh, The first day I went to Rhode Island College was the first day of orientation. I never toured it. I picked it because it was the cheapest school that I could find. He found me a scholarship that was usually reserved for the top student athlete in my high school. Now, I was a student athlete, but I was neither the top student nor the top athlete. He, I'm sure, jerry-rigged the whole thing. And I got a grand total of $500, and that covered my first year of tuition and books at Rhode Island College. And I went the rest of the way on Pell Grants. And so now, uh, what I realize is that uh, l so many times in my life, that's not the only time, someone saw something in me that they thought was worthwhile, that they thought was special, different, and decided to make an investment without my asking in my future. And I think that's a really important thing to do because I think one of the things that living without money does is it robs vision. It's not that the kids who live in the poor neighborhoods that we serve have the incorrect vision for their lives. They actually have the correct vision for their lives. They think they can't do anything. And everything about their life tells them that until somebody intervenes and says, no, your vision's wrong. You can do more. You can be more. And I'll help. But you have to do this, whatever the thing was. And so I've made my life now, and especially as I get toward the end of my career, which I'm sad to say I'm closer to the end than to the beginning, um, more about doing that and looking at the young people who work here and looking at the people in these neighborhoods and saying, how do we change the, their view? How do we change the, the systems that surround them so that they can have a different vision of the world that is actually based in some reality? Because this is not just about platitudes and telling people they can do things when the whole deck is stacked against them. You have to unstack the deck in some instances. In the instances of the young professionals who work here, we throw projects at them that they might not think they can do. Or we give them projects that they think they can do that we might not think they can do. We take a risk. We give them a chance to grow. And as a result, we keep them longer. We're seven times the best place to work in the state of Rhode Island. Um, and for me, that's to pay it forward. It's paying it forward to the guidance counselor and so many other people in my life who tapped me on the shoulder and s said, hey kid, and then followed it with something that totally shifted my direction. I kind of believe in uh, important questions. And so the one thing that kind of rankles me is the people who will sit with me and say, I did this myself, you know. I pulled myself out by my bootstraps, just like you, I had nothing. And look at me today, I'm this and that and this. And see these people over here? What they really need to do is get a hold of their bootstraps and pull themselves up. So I don't really think that's ever true. I think our bootstraps are tied to somebody else's hand to some degree. We're not, we're not passive victims of our circumstance where we get to sit back while someone else lifts us up. But most of the time we're partners with somebody, a teacher, a person who gave you a break at work. I mean, there's somebody who reached out at some point. And so I'll just ask questions like, really, you did this all yourself? So tell me about your career. Well, you know, when I started in this company, I was an intern. Really? You were an intern? You started here that young? Tell me about that. <laughs> How'd you get that internship? <laughs> and then pretty soon, we'll identify 
a string of people who moved the intern to the full-time job, who moved the young buck to a new opportunity to test his or her limits. And while I may not, never say to the person, and so tell me again about the bootstraps, because that's a little more confrontational than I care to be. I've at least shown the people where the bootstraps were <laughs> and whose hand was on them. More of a carrot than a stick. And so I've never been a big believer that you can beat someone into seeing your point of view, either you know, with logic or you know, verbally or otherwise. Um, but I think sometimes if you can ask the right questions, you can maybe get a lot of people to think and to feel a connection to the people you feel the connection for. And I do feel that connection to the people we serve because if I didn't know any better, but I could have been one of them. I probably was one of them. I went to Boys and Girls Club. I think that was a United Way uh, agency. Helped me tremendously. Still feel connected to it. Um, and so I feel connected to the kids who might use it today. A lot of people today don't want to be associated with the heart. They think it's not logical. They, you know, they're hard business people. They go with the facts. And, you know, they drive themselves forward that way. Um, if you had asked me to describe myself, I would never have said I was a heartfelt leader. However, I would have said I'm very passionate about what I do. And I get that feedback a lot. People who hear me speak about it, people who I meet with will say, I, I want to be involved with the organization because I feel your passion for this work. When I was in business school, we had a great speech teacher and she stayed with us the whole two years. And I used to talk with her about how could I sound more like the business leaders at the podium that I see. You know, they would, they would, have, they would be very present and, you know, have command of the facts. And she said, you don't want to be like them. They want to be like you. You have feeling and emotion. When you, when you speak, people feel stuff. When they speak, people don't feel anything. And I spend a lot of time coaching them to get what you already have. So stop thinking of yourself this way. Um, so I, and I think when you can communicate the facts, the data, the successes, you know, we have to do this all the time. We have to show people there are solutions to human service problems. We know that they're there. So we have to show them all of that. If we do that like a term paper, we lose. But if we do it with passion and conviction, we win friends and we win donors and sometimes we win the argument at the state house. I have something there. We have a little term here that we talk about sometimes. We say don't water the weeds. So the people who give you a lot of trouble, you spend a lot of attention on them because you're trying to change them and trying to help them come into the culture of the company. But if you water the people who are giving you the 110%, <laughs> then what happens is either the people look at that and go, oh, I see, and they come, or they say, well, I'm isolated here, and I have to go, right? And ultimately, I have learned, as 30 years as a CEO this year, is that it, culture changes many, many more people than any top-down initiative will ever change. So if you have a bad culture, you're going to spend some time cleaning that up. But you're not going to do it top down. It's not until peer-to-peer -peer feedback starts to happen. Hey, what do you mean? I, I don't believe like that. Why do you believe like that? Come on. That's different from my giving a big Im impassioned speech in front of the room about how we should all be more passionate. I don't have that problem here because everybody who comes to work here wants to work here.